graduated from, uh, which is very fun. And I, I like it a lot. Um, so yeah, uh, one of the projects that I worked on um, was some work on variable stars, which you guys, I'm sure already know, variable stars are stars that change in brightness, that vary in brightness over time. And there's a whole variety of categories of variable stars. Um, Variable stars help us find uh, where we have exoplanets because you've got changes in brightness from a planet passing in front of a star. Um, we've got changes in brightness from multiple star systems that are all passing in front of each other. We've got changes from uh, internal dynamics happening as the star changes some of its fuel sources. Um, we've got all kinds of different phases. Uh, a lot of red giants will go through. Uh, some variable phases. So all of them kind of go through uh, some different different times in their life, which makes them uh, which makes them change in brightness. So that was a particularly interesting uh, topic of mine to to study. And so I did that with uh, my my professor, who was also who was very interested in it, and who started the project of let's go uh, do some observing of variable stars. Um, so we use the observatory that we have at the school at American Public University to do our research. Um, we kind of did it in two phases. We did some throughout 2018 and 2019. Um, and through both 2018 and 2019 led to different reporting times, a reporting time in 2019 and a reporting time in 2020. Um, and so we kind of had two different groups of data and groups of variable stars that we focused on. And we found some pretty interesting things. Um, there were a few stars I couldn't quite include in the thing, but actually I, I can always come back and do another one on it because it was really, really fascinating. Um, and one of them I'm still, I'm actually picking back up more work on now that I get to, now that I get to teach and have uh, research assistants of my own, I'm picking up as a new project to be studying uh, some of these variable stars further in depth and kind of do phase three of looking at these variables. So this could be really cool. Um, feel free to stop me at any time with any questions or anything. Um, I'll go quick because I know that our session kind of ran over time um, just to, to work really quick here. Um, so let's see, I've got my thing up here. That's that one from here. There we go. I'll do this. Click on this one here. Get this to load up here and share my screen so that I can share it here with you guys. It's it's loading. Go, come on, come on. There we go. Fabulous. Slide. Slideshow. Slideshow. Awesome sauce. Okay, so first I've got to get out of here and need this and need a way to share my screen. There we go. Application. Here we go. Perfect. Awesome sauce. Awesome sauce. Get this to where it actually there does what I want it to do. Fabulous. Super. Um, so this was when we originally uh, presented our findings at the American Astronomical, uh, or, or I'm sorry, American, uh, yeah, American Astronomical and Variable Star Society. Um, variable Star. Yeah, uh, the American Association of Variable Star Observers. There it is. <laughs> I'll get it. I'll get it eventually. Uh, the, the Variable Star Observers group, um, they're a very popular uh, nonprofit group, which is always looking at variable stars and always taking in some really cool data. Um, most of their members are amateurs, just uh, spread all over the world. Lots of students, all kinds of amazing people who partake in gathering data about variable stars. And uh, collecting that data and also just researching it too. So they're a fantastic group. And then we've got a picture of our uh, observatory on the right there. And that was originally the, the conference that we kind of presented at. So let's see here. Um, yeah, so there's our, our university. It provides most of its education um, online. So a lot of the work that we did, um, we had to do kind of remotely. Uh, but there's the school and then at the top of the dome over uh, the top of the, the main building there which is really cool. So for our methods, we used we used our observatory as the main spot. Um, we did call on a couple other people at their observatories to help us take some other images when weather didn't cooperate, uh, which is kind of cool because your all of your research ends up being collaborative at some point, at some at some level, um, which is always great because the more you collaborate with people doing your own research, you, you're still 
part of that research um, and you get to share it with somebody else. And so somebody else also gets to have participated in it and gets to have that experience and gets to put it on their resume as well. And honestly, the more eyes you have on a project and on your uh, equations and on uh, your work, the more eyes you have collectively on those things, the less likely you are to totally miss something, um, which both me and my professor did uh, multiple times in kind of catching each other in any many mistakes. Uh, so this was our telescope. We used the plane wave CDK uh, 24 inch. Uh, it had its very nice dew prevention system, which is wonderful. Um, and then we had our two different cameras, uh, one camera for the smaller refractor, the Teleview NP-127, uh, and then the uh, first camera there for the CDK-24. So we mostly use the CDK-24 to get kind of as much exposure as possible uh, and, and catch our best images. We used our, there we go, we used our, um, our blue filter a lot um, there's not quite as much data uh, collected overall in the blue uh, Johnson Cousins filter. So that was kind of what we used. The blue filter does tend to collect um, images and brightness measurements that are dimmer than just what we see with like a typical uh, visual or green filter. So it does tend to collect something that's a little bit dimmer than that. But it do a different contrast. Uh, the blue filter gives you a slightly different contrast, very much like planetary filters well, where it's highlighting some of the dimmer features of the star and some of those things that you can see um, would include like how the star, how the star is kind of brightening and dimming through that particular color, that particular wavelength, as opposed to visual wavelength of around the 500 nanometers. The blue is going to be a little bit shorter than that and you kind of watch how it changes through that. Um, but since it's a little bit shorter wavelength, it also tends to be a little bit dimmer um, as the light that kind of comes through it. And then we used uh, Maxim DL as our main imaging software, and we used uh, the AAVSO's online uh, versions that they have for or online software that they have for measuring the magnitude. Maxim DL does it too, but not quite as efficiently, um, or we didn't think as efficiently at the time. Um, and so we used uh, their AVSO software to measure the magnitude from the images that we took. And so we just kind of uploaded them there and had it report back the magnitude data. Uh, once we had the images resolved to their exact coordinate spots, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, we focused on our Lyrae stars. We thought they were definitely the most target worthy stars to be studying. Uh, they're very short term periodic variables. So we only had about a year that the university granted us to be studying stars. So we wanted to make sure that in that time, we didn't spend it studying a long period variable that takes, you know, a hundred years or something, uh, or 20 years before it can really change brightness because we've done it with very much data. So we focused on some of those shorter term variables. And these are usually low mass uh, spectral class stars, A type stars. Uh, and they're a pretty important class because they, along with the Cepheid variables, they kind of go hand in hand of uh, uh, helping us to determine brightness, not brightness, uh, distances to other objects and to these stars and to other objects further out. They're very helpful in doing that because our Lyrae's are very much like Cepheids that they come to a certain brightness level so that we can actually kind of really tell their luminosity based on how bright they are because they only come to that certain luminosity level. Um, which is pretty cool. So we saw some articles as we were sur surveying, kind of doing a literature review of some different variable stars to do a project on, and these all looked really, really cool. Um, and so that's our, that's uh, the example star of our Lyrae. And yeah, more fun things about our Lyrae stars. I had more information about them, um, but they're really cool. Uh, yeah, they, this is where they come in to helping us determine the period relationship, period distance, uh, or radius relationship. Uh, so both their period tells us a lot about the radius of the star, and also that information helps us to determine things like this, the uh, uh, your, your mass and your luminosity, all of which can be used to help us figure out its distance, um, and thereby to the distance to whatever cluster it's in, or nebula, and things like that. So similar to the Cepheids. Uh, yes, 
kind of interesting. Yeah. Did I interrupt someone? Did someone have a question? No. Okay. Okay. Um, these were some of the images that we ended up taking. Um, so we had some nights that were better than others. The winter definitely gave us a little bit more noise and, and dust uh, than we got over some other periods of time. Um, so but there was our target star, and then these were our comparison stars. And we tried to highlight them and have them um, have them circled. Uh, we had consistency and we could always look at our images and knew exactly which star was our target and which ones we were using as our check-in reference stars. For the first batch of data that we collected uh, when we did the project in 2018 uh, versus when we expanded it out the following year in 2019. So in 2018, we were taking in data. Um, these were the four stars that we chose to be observing. They were all listed uh, by the AAVSO as suspected variables with not quite enough data and a little bit of back and forth on what type of variable star they were or if they were variable stars. So this was the data that we collected. Um, as you can see, there wasn't a whole lot in the way of variation. They were pretty, they were pretty straight um, and any real breaks that we had like so um, brought us a little bit closer uh, towards either some bad weather or when there were um, any changes in the telescope, things like that. Um, and so we didn't really have quite as good measurements in September for that one as we did here throughout September. Um, yeah, so we had several months for a lot of these. We only had several months, um, but these were these were ones where we pulled kind of. We really didn't come up with anything. So we submitted that as information to attest that these stars are probably not variable stars. Um, and then we took um, none of these and then we expanded and went to some other ones. Yep, these were our, these were uh, kind of the data points that we had, the number of images that we took, um, our dates and times for when we took some of those images and uh, how much data we ended up having across that uh, those particular areas. Um, AR Perseus did not end up, um, yeah, these were other stars that we also took data of. These were the main ones in the project. These were other stars we took data of, but none of them uh, came up with anything interesting. So these were even less interesting than these stars. Um, so it was safe to say that all of these were not, um, that these were not particularly uh, of great interest as far as uh, being able or great um, detail in our analysis to show anything had really changed or that these stars were variable stars. The other ones that we attempted to observe, uh, we just did not, we just were not lucky with the weather in March and April. It was far too rainy for most of those times when those stars were visible. And so we didn't, um, we did not end up catching a lot of data about them. So we couldn't conclude anything about those. Um, yeah, we also tried to, to positionally measure and uh, find some different groupings uh, that we were really interested in finding was to search for some different groupings in these stars in any of their brightness changes or in any of their uh, behaviors we were hoping to find uh, even though we didn't find any we were hoping that perhaps uh, we could associate some of that with the positions uh, of each of the stars uh, kind of based on like where some of the clusters were that they came from so we were hoping to derive more information but again we found that those stars really didn't change or vary a whole lot um, these were other stars that actually really did vary and they were very interesting too so these these were part of our 2019 expansion of the project and so i only have two stars um show you for that one i've got four that we that we did that we did some work on um, and two of them, I could not get the images to load. So I was gonna have to spend more time uh, working on why those images would not load into the presentation um, to show you their, their phase plot 
and kind of the data that we had on them. Um, but so this one was TY cam. Uh, so it was in Camelopardalis. So it was a little bit uh, dimmer kind of of a star. Um, let's see here. Let me get all the way to where I've got some data on this one. So for TY cam, there was a grand total of about um, about 10 years worth of data that we found um, archived on this star. Um, there we go. Here we go. Let's see. Yeah, there's a, a grand total of about um, 10 years worth of data on this star. Um, we only took data in for one year and contributed that to the rest of these. The data points in blue are the ones that we took. Um, and then the other ones, the the red and the pink, uh, is a couple are a couple other surveys. Uh, the AID data database uh, pulled data on that star, and so that's highlighted in green. Ours is in the blue, and the CRTS survey is in pink. Um, so altogether, there's about ten years worth of data on the star, um, and they were kind of scattered uh, with several different surveys. And so you had times where certain surveys would start and others kind of ended. Uh, so, but what we found for this star was just a reclassification. Uh, what we found was that it's listed by the AAVSO as being an RRAB type of variable, uh, as opposed to what we found, we believe it belongs into an RRC classification. And the real difference between the two of them is kind of their uh, their brightness and their um, how their light curve looks. Uh, because for their light curve, the RRC has a very smooth, almost sinusoidal kind of kind of look. Um, as this graph rather shows. So the best data that we could fit to a phase plot revealed, revealed this. Any other um, phases that we attempted to um, and degree, degree fits for the data, um, any other fits that we tried didn't really resolve the data into any, um, into any real curve. It kind of just had data scattered everywhere. This was where we actually saw the data come together. So and it looks very much like a very smooth sinusoidal curve uh, versus the RRAB classification is very, very short. Uh, it's very, very abrupt. Um, so it's much sharper uh, and you have this like uh, slightly kind of gradual, um, or actually it's very sharp incline and a very sharp decline. And so it kind of goes up and then it also uh, goes down very quickly. So um, we took some data on this uh, with the V filter, as well as with our blue filter, with our visual and our blue filter on the, with the observatory, um, just to kind of get a full picture of it. And so that's where, yeah, that's where we had the data um, fit best was giving us this RRC, very smooth, gentle type of curve on, on its light curve. Um, so we really didn't think that this followed any particular um, any particular like RRAB type of light curve, we thought that this this matches much better uh, data from an RRC. So this was a really cool star that we had fun looking at, um, and it was pretty neat to find kind of that reclassification for it um, based on kind of the phase plot there. Um, yeah, and the applied period that we found for this star was about 0.67 days. Uh, 0.6701 days. So that was pretty, that was a pretty neat star. We really enjoyed uh, looking at that one. So that was very fun. Yeah. So they're usually supposed to have kind of a gradual decline for an RRC and the RRAB is much sharper at its incline and its decline. And this one very gently slopes kind of in both directions here, which is pretty neat. Um, the other star that we had is, yeah, where did I go? There we go. The other star we had, and so this was several surveys where it's all kind of jammed together here, and it did the same thing. It was very gradual, very gentle, and does the same thing kind of going down, and it quickly kind of goes back up again before it just gently does the same thing. RAB should have something that's much sharper and a much sharper decline. So since we didn't find that with this, and this is what fit the period best, we really didn't think that that was a good match for it. This was one of our other stars. This was pretty cool because um, this one we believe is a uh, yeah. This one we believe is a double star, uh, not a double star, a double mode star. And this graph here shows it perhaps a little bit better than the than the last one does. Um, so let me get into my notes here about this guy a little bit. Um, yeah. So this one is 
V0363 Draconis. So it's in Draco, so it's definitely a northern region of the sky. Um, this gave us much more time to give a full observational circle on this particular star uh, and its light curve. And so let's see here. Yeah, so this magnitude range uh, was from about 12.3 to 13.6, depending on which filter we use. The blue filter uh, gave us a range that was much dimmer, as you can see from the results in blue, which are all, they're a little bit scattered, but they're also kind of on average, they're much lower. They're much lower here, where the magnitude is a lot dimmer, where you're at 13.3, 13.5, all of those types of things. So your magnitude is much lower over here than it is um, up here for all of the visual filters. And again, the pink highlights the CRTS survey, green is the AID survey, and red, if I recall correctly, is the uh, Assassin survey, which all had lots of good data. And it's always helpful to compile more data. And a lot of the blue data, um, not all of it, but a lot of the blue data is the data we took at APU um, that added to it that added to that survey. Um, so this one, so there was a smaller gap in data taken for this one. Uh, this, this particular star with all the different observatories taking images on it, this one has about 14 years altogether of data, a worth of data, um, with kind of one big gap in the data. Um, and that one big gap is where uh, the CRTS survey stopped and the AID survey began. Um, so there's kind of a gap in time of where some of those cover one part versus another. Um, yeah, and so we, re we fit this to a period. The input suggested uh, that we have a period of about 4 0.47 days. Um, so we kind of went with that as we graphed our, our, uh, our data on this, as we graphed all the data. Um, and so the data became very sharp and kind of abrupt and has some stops and kind of redirections there um, as with that 0 0.47, 0 0.47 uh, period, uh, like we had in the previous diagram of this one where it was kind of, it came to a sharp point and there was kind of a gap in there. So it didn't quite fit the data as, as cleanly as a slightly different one. Uh, so we tried a couple other period trends to find and see where this star's period really lied. Um, we came up, uh, the AVSO suggested 0 0.4032, so which actually we thought was a little bit more um, accurate, the 0 0.4032. Uh, that one seemed to fit the data a lot more, and it gave us the plot that we have here in the uh, in the image right here. It gave us this plot, and it kind of it does look a little bit messy, uh, but also. A lot of our data does kind of fit these trends. In here is where everything gets really messy. And also your pink data, where you kind of have this own, your own phase up here, and it's going down here, and then it's going up here again. And it looks very much like where sine and cosine waves overlap each other, and or, or like a sine wave, and then a sine wave with a phase that shifted just a little bit on the graph. And so you have this weird kind of echoing overlap of data um, and both of them are very good surveys, very accurate surveys. Neither of them experienced uh, any, you know, uh, abrupt difficulties in weather or operation for the several years that each survey operated, the green versus the pink. Um, neither of them operated with, you know, difficulties in something like that, that there's really operator error to blame. Plus, this is, this is very consistent data for both of them. So we believe that this was the much better fit for its period of 0 0.4032 days, because this star is also listed as a double mode variable star. And there's a lot of information about double mode variable stars that's still kind of unknown and is still being explored, um, particularly like what really is driving that double mode that happens there, but we do see it. And it makes these particular stars very, very interesting to keep uh, keep studying and trying to figure out exactly what's happening in these in these double modes here. Um, yeah, because in these double mode stars is where you've got, um, it's, it's like the star kind of starts to dim and then some other, some other part of the star starts to brighten again. And then they both kind of dim and then they both kind of brighten, but they're just off a little bit, but it's the same star. So it's one star that's going through 
brightness changes in such a turbulent motion uh, from whatever internal dynamics are happening. And there's various ideas out there about what's going on with the star. Um, most of the work that's done is really just looking at how to, how to measure this, how to predict this, how to um, identify this better. And the better you can fit data uh, all together onto a plot of, uh, of its periodicity of how a star is brightening over time, and you can plot that over time, the better we can fit most of the data, and we don't have data scattered everywhere, the better we can fit most of the data is where we really start to see these phase shifts come out. And that's really helpful as we see brightness changes, we can get an idea about um, specific date and times that go with it, and a lot of them are, are, are in the same spot. We can get more information from other telescopes about um, age of the star, metallicity of the star, things like that. All those things are contributing factors and still part of kind of the mystery of these double mode stars. We see them brighten. We're, you know, people are, are working more on exactly why, um, but we see them do this. We can measure it. Um, and so we try and get as much information as we can to help us navigate through what's going on with this star and why it is why it is exhibiting this weird double phase on uh, on its surface, what's happening there, what might be happening in the magnetic field. They make for very interesting stars to study. So this was a really cool one um, that we enjoyed studying a lot. And also at first, it was very confusing because we had data that was scattered all over the place. And somewhere in here is where we started to have some of that phase where we're more aligned uh, closer to the green data than we were closer to it towards like the pink or the red data here. Um, this was also really good uh, work for the observatory. Um, some of these data points were, most of these data points all below the graph here were all blue filtered data. Uh, some of these, I believe, are actually also blue filtered, um, but some of these are visual filtered as well. And so that was good, good exercise for the telescope, good exercise for the observatory itself um, to be looking for where the, the brightness is a little bit off with our own camera. Because every camera and every system has its own quirks. So it's not that even sometimes that we made operator error in taking in data. But when our data doesn't fit a lot of other surveys and a lot of other telescopes, sometimes it is something that we can point out and find what's what's off in our camera, or uh, perhaps you know we need we need some better uh, calibration data, something like that. Um, so sometimes those things are actually good good measuring flex points, which we had from some of our other variable stars that we looked at in phase one. So in phase two, we tried to be uh, we we navigated away from uh, being specifically the confirmation tool for some of those suspected variables. And instead we tried to, yeah, instead for our second phase, we had a really fun time with both of these, uh, me and my professor, Professor Syndergaard. Uh, so we had a really fun time uh, doing all of the research, but in our first phase, we were interested in uh, confirming some of these suspected variables or being able to toss them into the uh, category of not a variable. And so for all of these where we collected the most results, um, it was fun to collect that data. And that showed us that these can all be tossed into the bin of non-variable regular star, which is good because now these stars get to be, uh, they, they have the opportunity to be check and reference stars for other stars in the vicinity, um, which is pretty cool. So then in our second phase, we've tried to focus on some reclassifications, stars where classifications were a bit more split um, including TY Cam and V0363 Draconis. Uh, AAVSO was particularly interested and classified it as um, the double mode RRD, double mode RLIRE. And some other surveys weren't 100% sure. Some of them just listed it as an RLIRE with no classification. So anything that had a little bit more split on the classifications, we set out to um, help confirm and split down kind of those hairs to add some extra data that might help um, and help find some further periodicity data um, as well, or some periodicity findings on, on those as well. So that was pretty neat. Um, we had two other stars that we looked at as well. They were also really cool. We came up with some very interesting data on them. Uh, one of them, we were able to find its period, um, which was up for debate. 
along with its classification. Its classification and period were kind of up for debate among the different surveys. Um, so we think that we found that really well. Um, I'll have to I, come back and, and do, and do a, a, a topic on that one so you can see the other two stars. And our other, uh, our fourth star that we looked at, um, which again, I'll speak about it another time, uh, was pretty neat. Um, we found some, some pretty minor, but also turned out to be major mistakes in uh, in data taken about the star, where data was collected on a particular star, but it turns out that was not the star that anybody was observing. They were observing a different star. Coordinate data got messed up, and so we have we have a bunch of uh, interesting photometry data from uh, major uh, sources that are on the wrong star, and no data on the star that's actually at the correct coordinates. Um, so that was a that was a very interesting, very exciting finding, um, and definitely made us scratch our heads for a little bit. Um, so, but those I'll have to share with you on another time because for some reason I just could not make those images work in the presentation. My apologies. I don't know what happened, um, but I'll have to share that at another time with you. Um, and the yeah, we tried for some interesting galactic positional data and didn't really give us any information about some of their grouping tendencies with globular clusters, because that is typically where we find our Leary variable stars are in globular clusters. And so as we looked at some of those galactic positional data bits, um, including for our second phase of the project, we did not find anything that was uh, particularly helpful. So we don't expect to find any trends of these R Leary variable stars uh, spread and grouped more densely in one region or another of the Milky Way, um, which is helpful because since we typically find R Leary stars in globular clusters, um, we thought that we might find some greater density of R Leary stars the closer we got um, some greater densities. And we thought that we would find some greater um, magnitude changes uh, in, in finding other variable stars and in kind of showing us where their where they are located the most. Um, we didn't find anything uh, anything significant about their positions. We didn't find that these were stars that had uh, that were brighter or that were um, or that had shorter periods or that had um, any anything of interest the closer we got with our Lyrae stars towards the center of the, the Milky Way. We didn't find anything in there. We didn't find anything that was uh, that was particularly interesting. But hey, that's more information that we have uh, about them is that there's not a whole lot in the way of spread for these stars and in how the their positions across the Milky Way affects their brightnesses. We didn't find any sort of trends like that, which is a helpful tool. Um, yeah, these are very interesting stars. They tell us a whole lot about kind of the internal physics of stars themselves, how they transition from one phase to another, and hopefully we can get um, some more some more studies. So I'm picking up some work again here on those that double mode star. So I really wanted to be sure that I shared that one with you guys. Um, was that double mode of Z0363 Draconis? It's a pretty cool star. Um, we had a really fun time doing this project, my professor and I. It was very informative, and uh, uh, yeah, we found some really cool some really cool data there. Yeah, we had our little our little pets um, that were adorably fun in helping us. Uh, sitting on the laptop or just laying on on the corner of the the couch there uh, as we did our work. So that was fun. <laughs> that was very fun. Um, yeah. So I'll stop sharing my screen now. I hope I didn't go too badly over time here. There we go. Super awesome, awesome, awesome. And yeah, um, cool. So I, I'm happy to do let's do some some Q and A for a little bit maybe, or um, if you guys still have time, we'd love to, we'd love to do that. Uh, yeah, uh, we have time about 10 minutes here. Yeah. Perfect, all right, super, all right, super. Uh, so I had, I had a question. Um, yeah. How do you know that the double mode variation is happening on a single star instead of like, instead of if it being a, like a double star system? Yeah, so double yeah. star system so uh, it usually looks a little bit different. A double star system you have um, very little downtime in between those transitions. Usually what they look like is uh, kind of a much sharper, they almost look like an RRAB type of star. Um, so you'll have this sharper kind of incline. It gets very soft and curvy at the bottom, but your, your light kind of goes up in this nice peak 
and it just it just keeps going you don't have that weird overlap of like your your phases that kind of that kind of overlap each other uh out of the same star it is possible that it's another star that's another thing that they've kind of found with some of these stars is that we do initially look at them we're like oh i think this is a this is a is a double here and instead it ends up being a second star but usually what we have with a second star is that you've got you've got both of your stars and your brightness is going to go up when you have both of them alongside each other it's going to go down a little bit when you get to your second uh, to one star passing in front of the other and then they're both going to brighten to that same brightness level again and then when this one sorry when this one comes back in front of this one your brightness will go down but it'll also go down not quite to the same level so in the first one uh where you've got both of them visible, you're kind of at your peak of brightness. It'll go down a little bit because you lost the brightness from the second star. It passed behind or in front of um, your first one there. And so then it'll kind of brighten back up just a little bit. And then it'll dim just a little bit or it'll it'll brighten back up just, just a little bit because it's you're measuring just the brightness of the one star. So it'll kind of plateau to a little spot before it comes back bright again. And then it'll come back down to a slightly different spot and then come back up again. So you don't really see the crossed over version of the light curves, but you do see some weirdness. So it's not quite perfect like one star would be. Some of them do look like that if they're exactly the same type of star and exactly in the same same phase of life. Uh, they're exactly kind of the same brightness that you'll have it kind of do that, but it'll come down to one sort of brightness because you've got whatever the brightness is, if you've got brightness, if you've got magnitude like 10 for this one, magnitude 12 for this one, then when the 10 passes in front and your light curve drops a little bit, it's going to drop to that level of just the 10, as opposed to when this one crosses in front, it's going to drop to mm. the level of 12. And so your drop is a little bit different from where, where it is. That helps. Awesome. Um, hello, I had a doubt as well. So yeah. first of all, greetings and I extend my gratitude for such an illustrative uh, lecture. So uh, stars go through different stages in their lifespan. So do, does variable stars restrict themselves to a specific uh, part of the evolution of star? Yes, for these type of stars, they do. Uh, for our Aurelire stars, they do. The Aurelire stars uh, is a very short term variable uh, both in like how they, they brighten and dim, it's over a short period of time. And it's very short in that um, it's usually only present for a few thousand years, uh, maybe a thousand years in those. It happens right along the instability strip of the uh, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, right in there as the star is shifting from fusing hydrogen into helium and is starting its helium into uh, the CNO phase of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, as it's shifting phases there, getting into helium fusion is where the star at its core is starting to become unstable. And it'll go through either like a Cepheid type of phase or an Aurelire phase. Exactly what gets it to one or the other still is kind of up for debate and for some mathematical gymnastics to kind of play with um, to come up with why. But so it is a short kind of term of what where it happens. And then it only happens for that specific period of time. Once the star stabilizes uh, its helium fusion and then even gets past it gets past that and gets on into the CNO phase and goes deeper towards towards iron, it's kind of done. It's kind of done out of those. So it's a short period of time that we get to get to observe that. That's cool too. So just a follow up question. Uh, so the sun is like, is it a potential variable star? A potential what type of star? Like a radial, a radial velocity? Va yeah, variable star. So it hasn't still reached those uh, CNO phase, the sun, I guess. So can it still become a variable star? Yes, absolutely. Yes, it could still become a variable star. Um, we might see a variable phase for the CNO phase of stars, which there's not too many that we really have a great database of like CNO stars. It's not as wide as it is for our Lyrae variables. So that CNO phase could also introduce some variability, but probably for a shorter period of time. As the star starts, you know, fusing the one energy source into the other, it also takes more of those to create them, right? Like it only takes four hydrogen atoms to create a helium. Uh, but for to go from helium to other ones, sometimes you need like two of those helium, but they're also much more massive. And so you're going to end up using more mass. And a lot of that turns into energy that's keeping the star burning hotter and brighter. Um, 
But as it does that, you're, you're kind of using up some more of those energy sources and some more of that mass. And as the star approaches iron, it's going to get to being shorter and shorter time periods that it spends in each of those phases. It's going to spend a shorter, a slightly shorter period of time um, fusing hydrogen, or hydrogen uh, fusing helium into your CNO phases. Um, it's going to spend a slightly shorter time fusing oxygen into whatever else, barium, uh, magnesium, things like that. It's going to spend a slightly shorter time on those. And so it could definitely go through a variable phase, um, but it might be super short and we've yet to see it. Um, or I think there are some variables that are kind of in that category there too. So that's that's entirely possible. We just don't quite have enough data on those, on those uh, phases of a star's life to really tell us about what's what's happening to get it there fabulous question fabulous question yeah thank you that answers my question um i had another question uh, is this variability caused by internal factors in the star or something blocking the star from our view like some dust clouds or something like that oh that's a fantastic question oh my goodness i did a different project um uh, later, like the, the following year, I did a, a different project uh, with a different professor um, that actually was looking at that, that, same, that same question. Um, I don't think so for these particular stars, because uh, they didn't seem like they were in very dusty regions of the sky. Um, a lot of these, especially like the two that, um, that we kind of focused in on, on our second phase, were kind of away from the Milky Way. Um, T.Y. Camula Pardalis and V0363 Draconis, both of those are in northern, north polar regions of the sky around Draco and in uh, the giraffe Camelopardalis. I'm probably mispronouncing it too, um, but it's in those regions where they're not particularly dusty regions of the sky. So we tried to sh find some of those, some of those areas. Um, one of the projects I did later um, was looking at uh, Tabby Star, uh, let's see, I forget its number. Um, I'll remember its number in a second. Um, 862, oh, something, 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 um, a couple other numbers, uh, but Tabby's star, Boyajin's star, um, and that one's right along the plane of the Milky Way. It sits right in the plane of the Milky Way, and a lot of its data is all over the place. Um, there's lots of ideas. That's the one that a lot of people suspected might have a Dyson sphere around it, might have aliens interfering with its brightness, um, but that was quickly kind of debunked. Um, there's other better explanations a lot of popular explanations stick with that it's got some planets around it um what i found from my data on it um which i'd be very happy to share in the next time uh, as well uh to share that data with you guys because that would be fabulous um the other data that we kind of found on that was I, I used a radio telescope which actually is at the pisgah astronomical research observatory that's how i ended up getting hired with them uh, was using their telescope um and so that uh, that data that I took with the radio telescope was measuring and mapping kind of the intensity of that dust, um, that dust in between us and that star and in the region that it's located. Um, and a lot of that did cover some of the crazy flexibility um, in the star's light curve, which is usually what we see when we've got a lot of interference. When you have a lot of interference, it shows. It gives you, uh, and you're mapping a, a light curve, you don't ha usually have a very nice a uh, gradual curve that's very predictable and comes around at kind of the same same time period, you usually have some weird kind of scatterings everywhere and then it'll kind of stay steady and then it scatters again. And so it seems like it's unpredictable and kind of scatters a little bit all over the place, um, which we don't, we don't really care for when it scatters all over the place. If it's scattering all over the place, then it's like, what's happening with the star? It's getting bright, it's getting dim, it's staying constant, it's getting dim again, what's going on? It kind of seems like there's a lot more dust. Um, and so that was more of what I found as well uh, with the radio telescope was that it seemed like this really was a lot of that data about the brightening and, and dimming of Tabby Star. A lot of it really seemed like it really could be attributed to gas and dust in between, um, in between us and the star, particularly in that it's in the middle of the Milky Way. Um, there was still sort of a trend that once the, the data was all fit together, including the radio data, that it blocked out, um, uh, that it accounted for a great deal of its variability, but there was still kind of this very, very long term, like over several, several decades, it was like every 10 or 20 years that there was one long term kind of curve. 
And then it waited again, didn't come back until another like 20 something years later and didn't come back again until another 20 something years later. And it kind of went outside the range of what was covered by gas and dust, um, which was pretty cool. So some of these stars, definitely, we could be having a lot more um, of these stars that might be being overclassified as variables and might not be. Um, so it's always worth taking a look at just where they're just a quick look at a map and see where is this? Is this in the middle of the Milky Way somewhere? Or are we far away from that somewhere in the constellation Leo? And we're very far away from the Milky Way. What are we looking at? Um, so some of that dust distribution can help you can help you uh, find that out. Yeah, absolutely. That's a fabulous question. That's pretty um, that's okay. Pretty uh, so I, I think since we are a bit short of time, uh, maybe uh, is it okay if we share your email ID with others so they can probably make you questions? Yes, yes, please do. Please do. That would be fabulous. I would love to come back uh, some other time if you will have me. Um, and yeah, share yeah, you sure. have on the other stars, including Tabby Star with all that dust, because it kind of it makes a lot more sense when you can see the graph and you can see the data all fit together. It makes a whole lot more sense even than reading yeah. the describing it too. So that would be fabulous. I'd love to share all, all of those. Yeah, sure, sure. Sure, we'd love to have you again. Anyways, yeah. thank you for making it today. Uh, it, it was a great presentation and we'll surely stay in touch. Thanks a lot. Absolutely, will do. Thank you guys very, very much. Such an honor.